one of my favorite memories as a young adult back in February of 1980 was watching the Olympics on the night that the team from the United States, which was a little like David, was up against the Soviet Union team, which was a lot like Goliath. And at the end, we heard those famous words from the sports announcer, Al Michaels, who said, do you believe in miracles? Yes. How many people remember that night? That was a good night, wasn't it? But it kind of demonstrates that we have a tendency to call things that make us happy or that surprise us miracles. And I'm so glad that we are taking this time to look at the miracles, the real miracles performed by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, we are going to turn to John's Gospel, to the very first miracle that Jesus performed, according to John. It was a miracle that took place in the ordinary course of events of the life in the community. But before we do take a look at that text, let's pray. Loving God, we ask this morning that you give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts and minds willing to learn and understand. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now in John's gospel, the first half of his book, chapters 1 through 12, are often called the book of signs. And the latter half of the gospel is called the book of glory. But the reason the first half of his book are called the book of signs is because John takes the time to tell us the stories about the miraculous things that Jesus did during his ministry here on earth. We have the miracle we're going to talk about today when water was turned into wine, but we also have the feeding of 5,000 from just a few loaves and fishes. We have three healing miracles. We find Lazarus raised from the dead, and of course, Jesus and Peter for a while walking on water. But let's turn today to chapter 2 of John's Gospel to the story of a day that Jesus attended a wedding. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Now on the surface, this first sign, as John calls it, he never calls the miracles miracles, he always calls them signs, it took place at a wedding in a town not far from Nazareth, Jesus' hometown. It's quite likely that Jesus' mother Mary was a member of the family of the bridegroom. So Jesus and his disciples were invited, and Mary had some responsibility for providing for the guests. You see, in those days, a wedding wasn't like we have a wedding today. They lasted for a whole week. On a Wednesday, the bridegroom would take part in a procession that was lit by torches. They would take a long route walking through the hometown of the couple that was to be married so that many people could join the procession. And then the groom would arrive at the bride's house, collect his bride, and they would go back to the groom's home, which was often his family home. And after the marriage ceremony was completed, a feast would begin that would last seven days. The couple didn't go on a honeymoon, 
They feasted for seven days, and they were treated like a king and a queen. And part of the responsibility of that couple and the family of the groom was to make adequate provision for all the people who attended the wedding. And to fail to do so would bring shame and dishonor on the newlyweds and on the groom's family. So that's the reason why Mary, as a member of the family, became concerned when it appeared that the wine was going to run out, and she turned to Jesus, knowing that he had the power to solve the problem, and suggested, in a way only a mother can, that he should do something about it by saying, the wine's running out. Now, it's very important for us to understand that Jesus' response to his mother was not rude. Now, I don't know about you, when I was a young person, if my mother asked me to do something, if I had looked at her and said, woman, why do you involve me? I better have my track shoes on and be running for my life. But you see, when we look at this story that way, we kind of impose upon Jesus our cultural norms and the tone of voice that we often speak in. It's far more likely that Jesus used the word woman as a term of respect, because remember, even from the cross, as Jesus was dying, he looked down upon his mother, standing next to the beloved disciple, and said, woman, this is your son. And to the disciple, he said, this is your mother, ensuring that his mother would be cared for after he was gone. So don't assume that he was being rude. But he was doing something very important that day. What he was doing was letting his mother know that their relationship had changed. He was letting his mother understand that he was no longer her little boy. He was no longer going to be responsive to her first. But he was embarking on a public ministry where his focus was going to be doing the Father's will in the Father's way and in the Father's time. So when he said to his mother, my hour has not yet come, Jesus was almost foreshadowing. He often referred to his hour as that hour when he would go to the cross, when he would be resurrected, when he would ascend into heaven. And everything he did from this point forward in his ministry was focused on that end. And Mary needed to understand that the rules had changed. But Jesus was teaching us some other things for this miracle. I mean, when we look at this miracle, we might think, well, come on. Jesus walked on water, he fed 5,000, he healed people. Here, his very first miracle, what he did was save some newlyweds from embarrassment? Was Jesus just getting warmed up? No. Jesus was signaling to us. He was giving us a sign. Thus, John called the miracles signs rather than miracles. Because there were other people who did miracles. But Jesus wasn't into magic tricks. Jesus was giving us signs that revealed Truths about Jesus the Messiah and profound truths about God. And that day with that miracle, Jesus must have reconsidered his original response to his mother because he did indeed do something. And what he did in changing the water to wine, there's a few things we should notice about it. First, Jesus was at a wedding it was a joyful occasion. It was a celebration. He was willing to act to prolong that celebration and that joy. It reminds us that our faith, our worship, is supposed to be joyful and filled with celebration. We are not supposed to be sourpusses. Our faith is not supposed to make us, you know, the, the old picture of the preacher with the dark hat and the dour demeanor, and that's not what we're supposed to signal to the world. When we go display our faith, it's good for it to be joyful. Jesus is okay with a celebration. But Jesus also performed this miracle, not in front of an enormous crowd, not at the temple, not at the palace in front of kings. 
he performed this sign, this miracle, this act of mercy that saved a young couple from embarrassment in an ordinary home an event, in, at an event that was important in day-to-day -day lives, the marriage of a man and woman. Jesus isn't just about the big and famous places and the magnificent things and royalty and rulers. He cares about us. He cares about our daily lives. It's okay for us to go to him with the little things and not just save up the big things. In 1 Peter, there's a verse I just, it's love. I just love it. it. It reads like this. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Not cast your big anxieties, your life-threatening anxieties. We do that. We have no hesitation to turning to Jesus in the big crises, but this act of Jesus on this day shows us that Jesus cares about the little things and the day-to-day -day things. And Mary's actions on that day remind us that we should turn to Jesus for all of life's issues. That we should believe and be prepared that he will solve the problem we, be, we bring to him. Sometimes not in the way we expect or we want, but Jesus cares, and he can, and he does address what we bring to him. And finally, Mary reminds us, listen for his guidance and then do what he says. She told the servants, do whatever he tells you. In those moments when we start getting kind of lost, when we feel overwhelmed, when we fear our ability to accomplish the task at hand, it's always okay, okay to close our eyes for a moment and listen for the voice that says, follow me, follow me. And then the thing we need to do is follow him. Not do our own thing, but follow him. But John's, John's gospels, when he, when he told these sign stories, they were also intended to teach us a profound and important truth about God. And what we need to understand in this story, that those water jars, those weren't little gallon water jars or bottles like we get at the store today. Those were big stone jugs because stone would not absorb impurities. And they were used in Jewish faith and Jewish culture for the purification rites. When guests came to the wedding after parading through the streets, their feet were dirty. Their feet needed to be washed. Before the meal, they had to go through the purification rituals that were part of the Jewish faith. And between each course of the meal, they did the same thing. They would hold their hands this way. Water would be poured over them. Then they would turn their hands this way and water would be poured over them again. And so the water in the jars, the more these rites were followed, became dirtier and dirtier. And with each course, the washing ritual had to happen again and again. And Jesus took this dirty water in these six jars that together would have had somewhere between 120 and 180 gallons of water, and without fanfare, he didn't stand up and have everyone pay attention and say abracadabra, he just did what he did and sent the servant to take what was drawn out of that jug filled with dirty water up to the master of the banquet. 180 gallons of wine. Who needs that much wine at, at, a, at a wedding? Nobody does. Not in the biggest wedding in the world do you need 180 gallons of wine. But what the, the magnitude of this sign teaches us is that God is abundant in God's blessing of us. And in biblical times, wine was a very, it had a very important symbolic meaning. If we look back in our Bibles to, um, to one of the minor prophets, if we look back at Amos, what we will see 
is a place where Amos says, the days are coming, declared the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills, and I will bring my people Israel back from exile. Wine was a sign of reconciliation. It was a sign of abundance. It was a sign of celebration. The hills, the, the wine was going to pour off the hills. The mountain was going to drip with wine. And people in Jesus' time would be familiar with these words of the prophets, words given to the prophets by their great God. The wine meant something. If we look later in John's gospel in chapter 10, there's a verse that many of us are familiar with. Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I came that they may have life abundantly. This, this demonstration of Christ's power was a demonstration of the abundance that he could provide. But he also took an imperfect legalistic ritual of purification and he perfected it. It wasn't a perfect ritual. If it was, people wouldn't have to do it over and over and over again. He took this ritual of washing and he perfected it by injecting into it his grace. And with his grace, the old law's imperfections became perfect, abundant, and transformative. The dirty water became pure, perfect, celebratory wine. Like the wedding guests that day, they didn't know this had happened. They just knew the wine was good. We often miss the miracles that take place. We miss God's signs because we're too focused on our busyness. Sometimes we don't have faith that God cares about the little needs, that God only cares about the big needs. And there's way too many people out there for God to care for, and why would God worry about me? But this miracle tells us that God cares about all things. And with this miracle we are reminded that sometimes it's important for us to believe what we can't understand. We come from this enlightened age. We're very proud of our educations and our understanding of science and the universe and the planets and neurons and neutrons and all those things. But at the end of the day, one of the things that I love most about my faith is there are things I cannot explain and I have finally... It took me 60 years. I don't care that I can't explain them. I will no longer keep God in the box of science. But if we keep God in the box of science and we only believe that God can do what sci science can explain, then we miss the miracles that happen around us. I see miracles every day in the ordinary things that happen in the gorgeous beauty of a sunrise or a sunset. Are there more beautiful sunsets anywhere than on Florida's Gulf Coast? Are there? I, I see a miracle, I hear a miracle in a baby's cry. When a church pulls together so a baby can get a new heart. When young people who have sought medical treatment in the church show up at the back to school jubilee and act as role models for little boys and girls whose lives are hard. When people in our church prepare meals and take them to the homebound and offer them as a gift of love, those are all miracles. And you know why they're miracles? Because the greatest miracle that Jesus does in our day in and day out lives, he turns us into new wine. He turns us into new wine. Jesus took ordinary things and he did extraordinary things with them. Water becomes the symbol of our baptism. Water, the, like water that comes out of the faucet, water that's in the gulf becomes a sign, an outward sign of his inward grace that we're made new. 
that we become part of the family. You're my family, not just my friends, you're my family by virtue of my baptism. By virtue of that simple sign, that water, we are clothed in the regal robe of Jesus Christ. Is it any wonder that Jesus' first sign involved wine? Only three years later, once again, Jesus would use wine to teach us something very important. Today, as we go to his table in just a few minutes... We are going to be reminded that he turned water to wine and then three days later, three years later at another meal celebrating the Passover, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper lifting a cup of wine. This is a sign of a new covenant. This is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Water bread, wine, the simple things of our lives, and Jesus used them to do extraordinary, miraculous things that are a signal to us that life is transformed. So today, as we go to the Lord's table, let's go like the wedding guests, with joy and celebration. Let's be like the bride because we are the bride, the bride of Christ. Jesus is our groom. Let's go with a willingness to follow the one who says, follow me. Let's go with a belief that our Lord is the Lord of miracles. You know, in a a few weeks, something extraordinary is going to happen to me. The bishop's going to put his hand on my shoulder and make me a deacon, but not really. Jesus has been making new wine for eight years. And if he can make new wine out of me, man, what he can do with you, it's amazing. And I I will tell you, the first day that I come here dressed in different clothes, It's called an alb. Deacons wear an alb. It will never be an alb for me. For me, it will always be the new wineskin into which Jesus poured new wine. We have to believe in these miracles. Al Michaels said, do you believe in miracles? And my friends, the answer has to be yes. Yes.